and um, away we go. Guy McPherson says humans have less than 10 years left on the planet. Do you agree? All my reporting on the climate crisis for the last 10 years shows trajectories of acceleration of basically everything. Ice loss, methane release, CO2 keeps being emitted at record levels, the fires in Australia, the fires in the Amazon. Things are happening now so much faster than even the worst case IPCC projections, coupled with certainly dozens of self-reinforcing feedback loops are kicked in and not going to be stopped. And everything indicates that what can be said for certain is that things are going to get increasingly intense far faster than anybody expected. Um, I personally had made predictions in the past about when I thought we would probably lose the Arctic summer sea ice. and was wrong a couple of times and realized it probably wasn't in my best interest to make predictions. Um, so I don't really say what I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I honestly just don't know. Um, could humans go extinct? We certainly appear to be on a trajectory that it looks as though humans are going to go extinct. When? Who knows? Is that a certainty? Who knows? So I've just stopped making personal predictions on that um, because it's, um, it's uh, for my own credibility as a journalist and after being wrong a couple of times I stopped making those predictions. But uh, um, I think his, his concern and his analysis that show the possibility or even likelihood of humans going extinct, I think it's, I think it's very, very probable. Um, at this stage. Uh, does that mean that there, there could be some unforeseen things happen, either that the planet does or that humans might do that would enable some humans to continue? That's possible too. So who knows? What are climate change feedback loops and what's the concern? Feedback loops are the, the most basic way to put it is the more something happens, the more something happens. Um, the most famous one being the reduction of the Arctic summer sea ice. So it acts as this big reflector as the atmosphere warms uh, that, and, and the water underneath it warms, that ice shrinks, exposing more dark ocean, which absorbs more sunlight and heat, which causes the ice to reduce that much faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it goes, so it goes. So um, that's uh, one of dozens now that we know are happening. So, you know, the faster glaciers melt, the faster they melt, uh, this kind of thing. So there, there are dozens, as I said, already kicked in, and uh, most of these are not reversible by humans. And uh, the reason to be concerned about them is that when you take uh, layers and layers of these feedback loops and put them on top of each other and then they start having these compounding effects off of one another. It's going to cause what some of the scientists I've spoken of, uh, spoken with, have warned that they will cause changes that are abrupt, uh, definitely nonlinear, and very, very difficult to predict. So we could see massive abrupt changes on a global level happen on a very, very short time scale, not geologic time scales, maybe not even really human time scale, but literally abrupt massive changes. And that's why it, just a few years ago, very, very few people were talking about runaway melting in Antarctica. Now it's headline news in major media. So that's happening that fast. Uh, like last year, the wildfires in the Amazon um, we saw an 80% increase in wildfire fires in one year over the same time period of the previous year. These kind of abrupt changes. The Amazon's possibly already passed a tipping point of where the majority of it will turn from rainforest into savanna. This is going to happen very, very rapidly. And then how does that affect water availability for people there? How does that affect climate systems around the planet? We're talking about a major global shifts could happen like that. And that's, I think, the most important thing that people need to understand about these runaway feedback loops and then how they all feed off of one another. As global temperatures rise and the human population expands, 
more of the planet is vulnerable to desertification, uh, the permanent degradation of land that was once arable. Uh, while land degradation has occurred throughout history, the pace has accelerated, reaching 30 to 35 times the historical rate, according to the United Nations. More than 75 percent of Earth's land area is already degraded, according to the European Commission's World Atlas of Desertification, and more than 90 percent could become degraded by 2050. How does climate change affect desertification? One of the primary ways is you increase the temperature of the atmosphere and warmer temperatures draw more moisture out of the land and whatever trees and vegetation are there. Um, in fact, it's, that has a stronger effect on trees, for example, than even water availability. And so when you ramp up the temperature of the atmosphere, and it sucks that much more moisture out of the land, then that's a cause. And then, of course, we have the drought factor. Climate change is causing far more, far more severe, and far longer droughts than, than have ever, ever been recorded. And so that, obviously, is causing desertification. And then uh, extreme weather events. So a warmer atmosphere absorbs that much more moisture, can hold it for that much longer, and then you'll have one huge torrential downpour but then it takes that much longer for that much more moisture to come back out of the land and then recharge the atmosphere because it's that much hotter. So all these things happening simultaneously has a dramatic impact on desertification. And those statistics you give are shocking and, and worrisome as, as they should be. And then lop on top of that human development and human encroachment into wilderness areas where uh, it's, it's been the moniker since Earth Day started the whole hug of tree that, you know, one of the best things we could do for climate change is, is for mitigation is to plant massive amounts of trees and instead we're losing them at shocking rates, both from runaway climate feedback loops uh, and from human encroachment. You know, what's happening in the Amazon, for example, of chopping down um, more than an acre of rainforest every second, mostly for beef production. Um, that should not be happening. We should be doing the opposite and, and setting aside more wildlands and planting more trees and instead human encroachment, which is another huge contributing factor to that. When sea levels rise mm -hmm. as rapidly as they have been, even a small increase can have devastating effects on coastal habitats farther inland. It can cause destructive erosion, wetland flooding, aquifer and agricultural soil contamination with salt, and lost habitat for fish, birds, and plants. How does climate change affect sea levels rise? Climate change affects sea level rise uh, in several ways, but the two biggest are uh, the melting ice across the planet contributing to sea level rise, and then the second one is thermal expansion of the oceans. When water is warmer, it takes up more space physically. And uh, the oceans the last, I believe, six years in a row now have set a record warm temperature every one of the last six years. But so what, what we see, like I mentioned Antarctica earlier. So if we have a warmer atmosphere, that's contributing to surface melting, which in Greenland, that's been the big factor. Um, we look at what happened to Greenland last summer, record massive, shocking amounts of melting where leading scientists there warning of, look, we're, Greenland is on the way out. Like we're, we're seeing irrevocable, irreversible melting where um, the, the only thing keeping Greenland an ice sheet is because there's, it's so high and there's so much ice there, but it's in the process of being lost. But you look at Antarctica, for example, then you have not just warmer atmospheric temperatures, but there so much of the melting is happening from the warmer ocean, so it's coming from underneath. So you look at the Thwaites Glacier, which is sometimes referred to as the Doomsday Glacier, because it's holding back. It's basically um, on the land underneath the water, and that's what's keeping it in check. But as, that, as it's being melted from warmer oceans below, once it loses that point of contact on the land, it's going to basically um, stop being the plug that it is for the massive amount of ice behind it. That alone is going to be a massive and immediate contribution to sea level rise. Or if we look over at the western Antarctic ice shelf, the vast majority of that is it's, it's already in the ocean and it's being held in check. 
And as that melts from below, you could see a, a, a relatively abrupt amount of that ice lost in an extremely short period of time. In the West Antar Antarctic ice sheet, that's eight feet right there, minimum, of sea level rise that we could see in a very, very short way. And this is why we see uh, James Hansen was co-author of a study uh, fairly recently that showed, based on paleoclimate models, we could see, in theory, a 10 feet sea level rise by 2050. If some of the th these things happen that I just mentioned, like the Western Antarctic ice sheaf and continued melting apace in Greenland, as we're seeing right now, that it is not out of the realm of possibility to see that abrupt of a level of sea level rise in that short amount of time. Tropical coral reef coverage around the world has declined by 30 to 50 percent since the 1980s. Nearly 75 percent of the world's reefs face threats from pollution, habitat destruction, overfishing, and increasingly a changing climate that increases temperatures, sea levels, and acidity in the oceans. How does climate change affect coral reefs? Uh, two primary ways. The, the most pronounced way that climate change is impacting reefs is the warmer oceans. So coral exists within a certain temperature threshold and when you warm the oceans that coral will bleach and bl by bleaching it means the co coral gets its beautiful colors from uh, algae that are on it uh, but that algae becomes toxic if it gets too warm. So the coral will literally um, eject that and that's when it turns bone white hence the term bleaching. And then if the waters cool down in time, then it will take that algae back in and survive. But if it doesn't, then it will literally, it's starving without that algae. And as things are warming now, um, it's way beyond a normal natural background rate uh, of, of bleaching, which in a normal, on a normal planet without uh, uh, climate change, then you have coral reefs that uh, there will be normal bleaching events. Um, but typically it'll take a coral reef to uh, 10 to 12 years to come all the way back from a, a natural bleaching event. But now the problem is it's ha they're happening so fast, like cite the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, where year after year you're seeing these coral bleaching events and it's literally not coming back. So, uh, for example, a, a very distressing study at the end of last year showed that after the last coral bleaching event for the, the Great Barrier Reef, 89% of the coral is not reseeding. So, and that's due not only, but primarily because of the warmer temperatures. Uh, and then throw on top of that acidification. So as the oceans absorb CO2 that we're emitting, which is an ongoing process, they're becoming increasingly acidic. And so that makes it harder for coral to grow and other, other um, calcium-based organisms in the ocean. And then throw on that overt human damage like dumping, toxics, um, dredging, things like this. So all of that together and destructive fishing pr practices all contribute to this really multi-pronged assault on coral reefs. And so I believe it was 2011, NOAA published a study that warned that at current trajectories, if things didn't change, that we could see no more functional coral reefs on the planet by 2050. And I've talked to several coral biologists that said they think that study is far too uh, conservative, that uh, it'll probably happen long before then. 18 of the 19 warmest years all have occurred since 2001. How does climate change affect the warming of the planet? Well, the, the basics of it are that CO2 is a heat trapping gas, and if you add heat trapping gas into a finite area, which our atmosphere is, and keep adding it, then it will warm up that area. So it's, it's basic high school physics. Um, and so that's the predominant factor, but then of course we have the warming oceans, the oceans absorbing more CO2, and then what happens on the land. So as desertification increases, as we talked about, and uh, uh, human encroachment does away with trees and forests and vegetation, and we see loss of species in, in their habitat, all of that on land is another so, sort of runaway feedback, if you will, of the climate crisis. And you factor in these and so many of the other things that we've already discussed together, that's, that's how it's playing out. So we, we, we see increasing atmospheric temperatures, increasing oceanic temperatures, the loss of ice, and then how that's affecting um, our ability to grow crops year round, 
seasonal changes, water availability, um, all of these together are different expressions of the climate crisis. The world's insects are hurtling down the path to extinction, uh, threatening a catastrophic collapse of nature's ecosystems, according to the first Global Scientific Review. More than 40% of insect species are declining, and a third are endangered, the analysis found. How does climate change affect the extinction of insects? A 2019 study showed in a very worrisome and alarming way that we're losing, we being the planet, are losing 2.4% insect biomass every year. So that means that we are on track that certainly within the next 100 years, assuming that does not accelerate, which right now would be a false assumption, but assuming that was a steady rate of loss each year, um, within 100 years we would have very little insect population left on the planet. And that, by definition, means, that alone means no, no humans. We can't, given the role insects play in a functional ecosystem, i.e., you cannot have a functional ecosystem without insects, uh, uh, humans simply won't exist. Uh, so that is an extremely worrisome thing. Uh, alarm bells should be sounding uh, when we talk about what's happening to the insect population on the planet. Scientists have published more than 230 peer-reviewed studies looking at weather events around the world from Hurricane Katrina to Russia's 2010 heat wave. The result is mounting evidence that human activity is raising the risk of some types of extreme weather, especially those linked to heat. Carbon Brief Analysis suggests 68 percent of all extreme weather events studied to date were made more likely or more severe by human-caused climate change. Uh, you've mentioned some of these before. Can you expand on uh, how climate change affects extreme weather events? Well, I th you know, let's take hurricanes, for example. Um, how climate change affects hurricanes is that you have uh, a warmer ocean than you would without it, and that's going to amp up the strength of the hurricane and contribute to wind speeds. And then that same warmer ocean means there's going, uh, there's going to be uh, more moisture evaporating, uh, f also alongside a warmer atmosphere. And that's going to pull that much more moisture up, so there are going to be increasingly severe rain events associated with these increasingly more powerful, stronger hurricanes. Also, if you look at Hurricane Katrina, for example, it was a Category 3, but it was so broad. If you look at the satellite images of that hurricane, which are easy to find online, it, it, by the time it hit New Orleans, it encompassed a vast swath of the entire Gulf of Mexico. So it was pushing a storm surge of water of, of up to 21, 22 feet that normally is associated with a Category 5 hurricane. So that's why also in the last year, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration was talking about possibly needing to generate a Category 6, which right now the, 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 the scale only goes to 5, but literally create a whole new category for hurricanes because primarily of climate change, because the amount of rainfall that they're carrying now that we haven't seen before, the storm surges, and absol absolutely how massive the storms are. So that's one example how climate change is really amping up uh, extreme weather events. So we've always had these extreme weather events, but now they're, they're happening on a scale that we haven't seen before and more consistently. What are the most important steps we can take to stop climate change? And what does the government need to do? What can, what can individuals do? You know, from my perspective of writing about this crisis from all the different aspects for a long time, I, I understand fully that we're way past the point of no return. By that, I mean you're, we're not going to stop it. We're not going to change it. Um, the best case scenario is maybe there'd be some mitigation. But the primary, I think, thing that all of us should focus on now is adaptation, that, that learning to live on an irrevocably changed planet, that there's not going to, renewable technology is not going to save us, the Green New Deal is not going to save us, that we don't have time, you know, thinking that we have 10 years or 12 years to avert the worst impacts. Uh, I say that that's a pipe dream because if you look at the global political system and the global fossil fuel-based economy, there is nothing to indicate that any government on the planet is going to react 
in the way that it would have to react to cause serious mitigation. And by serious mitigation, I mean literally in a matter of single digit years getting completely off fossil fuel, a fossil fuel based economy, shifting over to renewables, dramatically reducing travel down to the point of essentially almost no air travel within less than a decade. I'm talking these kinds of changes on a global scale to cause the kind of mitigation, i.e. stop emitting CO2 at the level we are, which by the way, PS 2019 was another record year of CO2 emissions for the planet. And there's nothing to indicate that that's going to happen uh, this year, next year, within the next five years. So while we have some countries talking about, okay, by 2030, we'll have CO2 emissions back down to 1990 levels or this kind of thing, that's certainly a step in the right direction. It's absolutely the moral thing to do. But let's not kid ourselves and act as though, oh, that's going to really generate mitigation because that's a drop in the bucket. So that leaves it upon each of us to take a very clear, sober, honest assessment of this is where we are on the history of this planet. Now, what am I going to do? And one way I like to talk about the imperative of it is that Let's, let's pretend that we're on our deathbeds, and however old we are, f fast forward, pretend you're on your deathbed, assuming you have a long life, and then a, a, a child comes up and says, wow, you were alive in 2020, and there was still uh, summer sea ice in the Arctic, and we still had the Western Antarctic ice sheet, and we still had the Amazon uh, for the most part, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did you know that there was a planetary climate crisis. And of course, we'd have to say yes, because anyone alive today has to know about it, at least cursorily. And then that begs the ne next question is, what did you do? And I think that's a question that we need to be asking ourselves right now, because it's a very personal, individual question that each one of us has to then think about, how would I want to be able to answer that question? Because I think the question leaves open basically the moral obligation for some pretty radical actions to be taken. In chapter seven of The End of Ice, what did you mean by the fuses are lit? That, I, I titled the chapter that way because it was a line that Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, the often referred to as the godfather of biodiversity, an Amazon expert, been studying it since 1965, and I, I was interviewing him in Camp 41, his most famous study camp down there, for the book, and he talked about how the fuses are lit on these different parts of the ecosystems of the Amazon. And the problem is we didn't really know enough about the Amazon to know exactly where those fuses are and then how they're going to end up. Uh, essentially, the bombs that they're going to detonate that could essentially be the end of the Amazon as we know it. And he has since come out and warned about crossing over these tipping points. He said, uh, it's estimated that if we lose between 20 and 25 percent of the Amazon rainforest as we know it today, that that would be the threshold at which the rest of the rainforest would essentially just turn into savanna. That you need enough of it to exist to stop that from happening. And the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, estimates we've already lost roughly 17 percent. That doesn't include the amount lost last summer from the fires. We could well already be over that tipping point at which uh, we all, irrevocably the Amazon turns into savanna instead of rainforest. Those are the fuses that, that top, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy warns that we can't be running around lighting them nor letting them burn because if we do that, we could lose the whole thing. And that's what he's really concerned about. And, and so those are the fuses. And you, you hear some of that same language in some of the scientists studying the Antarctic. One of them said, we all know the fuses are all lit. We're just waiting for the bombs to go off. The bombs being, for example, like the Thwaites Glacier that I mentioned earlier, that, that once that comes unplugged and it frees up all that ice and you have a, an, a, on a human time scale essentially an in, instantaneous being in just a few years, probably the amount of ice that is going to come out of that a few years or a couple of decades, you're looking at um, relative immediate loss of, of major coastal cities. So 
those are the kind of fuses that are already lit and, and we're waiting to see the effects of it. You've mentioned a few. What are the top causes of climate change? Well, CO2 emissions, obviously, um, methane emissions from the thawing permafrost, from subsea permafrost in the Arctic, from, the, from industrial agriculture. This is a big one that doesn't get talked about that much. Uh, some, some studies show that there's even more CO2 and methane emissions from industrial agriculture than there is from the fossil fuel industry. That's a really big one uh, because you factor in the amount of uh, desertification caused by industrial agriculture, the, um, how water intensive it is, all of that contributes to uh, a warming planet and more CO2 emissions and less uh, wildlands there to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So those are, those are really the biggies. While independent media outlets still exist, and there are a lot of them, the major outlets are almost all owned by just six conglomerates. How does the major media being controlled by just six companies affect the public's perception of climate change? Mm -hmm. And that statistic alone is why I got into independent journalism, um, uh, being shocked at the information control, uh, whether it comes to war or climate change or what have you. And the lack of honesty in the corporate media about the crisis and A, that we're in one, B, how far along we already are, and C, what is a realistic response at this point. There's been basically no coverage of that. Uh, the Guardian has done a pretty good job, but I think uh, most people would, in the United States anyway, would probably not consider that a mainstream media source. But that aside, for the most part, um, aside from a few odd decent stories in the New York Times or the Washington Post, um, most of the media is just not covering it accurately. And it's because uh, you look at the advertisers. I mean, I personally don't watch TV, but I know from media analysis, if you look at the lead advertisers in television, when you have Boeing and car companies and oil companies funding so much of the advertisements, um, there you have, that's who's driving the bus. So it, it's bad for their business for people to understand, I need to get off fossil fuels, I need to annually be reducing my carbon footprint. I need to be consuming less of everything. It's just bad for business, and that flies in the face of what the mainstream media is intent on selling people. In chapter three of The End of Ice, what did you mean by the canary in the coal mine? Hmm. Uh, the canary in the coal mine was uh, an analogy that I used for uh, how the indigenous population that I spoke with uh, several members of on St. Paul Island and the Pribilof Islands. These are a very, very small island group in the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska. Um, St. Paul has roughly a 234-year-round population, uh, subsistence lifestyle, commercial fishing. Those are the two primary means of, of uh, the way that they feed themselves. And the Aleutian folks that I spoke with out there, several of them referred to themselves as the canary in the coal mine because they are living so close to the land. By, by that I mean their, all of their livelihood and their food comes from um, the ocean and seabirds. And so when climate change makes less seabirds and less marine life available for them, uh, for eating as well as for carrying on traditions uh, that they've practiced for millennia, then they're, they're the first ones to feel it. And, and it's having the immediate and most severe impact on their culture. And so they've described themselves, hey, we're the canary in the coal mine. When you start tweaking the, the global climate, we're the ones that are gonna show the signs the most immediately and, and the most severely. And that's true for so many indigenous populations around the globe. And, and that was, in a sense for me in the book, it was a bit of a case study because it's completely isolated, a very, very small population, and they were absolutely exhibiting very alarming warning signs of what's happening on the planet. Can you sum up in 15 seconds everything we've talked about today? We are in a planetary crisis and people need to take that in deeply and then make very, very personal decisions about how are they going to choose to comport themselves at this moment in history. What's the one thing I need to do today? 
Hmm. Be very, very honest about this era of endings that we're living in. What is it about the real truth about health conference that made you decide you needed to be here to speak? Climate change is the s cause, it's the single biggest human health crisis ever because it affects everything. Our food availability, water availability, smoke inhalation from wildfires, extreme weather events to if we lose the Amazon, how many future drugs are we losing? Same with coral reefs. The climate crisis affects every aspect of our health and increasingly so going forward. Disease outbreaks, heat waves, you name it. And so I think a conference like this is critical and I think each year will become even more important the deeper into the crisis we get. So that's why I wanted to come. For people that want to learn more about your work, where should they go? I maintain a website. It's darjamail.net. It's D-A-H-R-J-A-M-A-I-L.net. And that's where I archive uh, the articles I've written and where people can find out more about my books as well.